Good afternoon in New York and good evening in Jerusalem. My name is Linda Levy and I'm the director of the JDC Global Archives. I'm pleased to welcome you to today's webinar. We are thrilled that so many of you have joined us uh, for this wonderful program. First, a quick word about the JDC Archives. The JDC Archives holds the records of the JDC since its creation 107 years ago. Visiting scholars from around the world, as well as publishers, journalists, family researchers, curators, and filmmakers, and others use our collections for their research. We also offer fellowships to enable scholars to conduct research in the JDC archives. Our co-sponsor for today's program is the Binatibe Hapala Information Center, which is located in the former British detention camp in Atlit, Israel, which is now a national heritage site. The Information Center is dedicated to Jewish clandestine, clandestine immigration to British Mandatory Palestine and documents the stories of the illegal immigrants and Ha'apala activists through personal testimonies, family stories, and archival documents from various archives in Israel and across the world. Our program today focuses on the assistance that JDC provided to Holocaust survivors detained in the British detention camps in British controlled Cyprus and will include a lecture on JDC's work in Cyprus as well as a presentation on the artworks and crafts created by the Jewish detainees during their time in Cyprus. The program will, conclu will conclude with a 15 minute question and answer period. Please note that your microphones are turned off and we will take questions via the Q&A function. You can send us questions at any time during the lecture. Our first speaker, Dr. Anat Kutner, is the director of JDC's Jerusalem Archives, which houses the records of JDC's work in Israel and of JDC overseas offices including the records of JDC's operations in Cyprus. Previously, Anat was a project manager at the National Library of Israel and later directed a department at the Yad Vashem archives. She has a PhD in history from Bar Ilan University. Her research interests include the role of JDC and its work in the contemporary Jewish world and in the history of the state of Israel. Anat will now present on the role of JDC in the rehabilitation of Cyprus detainees, 1946 to 1949. Good evening. Cyprus, to romanticists, the legendary island of Aphrodite, goddess of love. Here in Cyprus, their hold to them of their promised land, the refugees wait until time turns to turn them from illegal into legal immigrants. In these worlds, British Jewish journalist, Maurice Perlman, who joined the Mapilim ship Theodor Herzl to give a first-hand account of its journey, described the self-perception the self of the deportees to Cyprus. In the next half hour, I would like to elaborate on this description and talk about a short but meaningful period in the history of the Jewish people. I will start with some brief, brief history, with some brief historical background, and devote the main part of my presentation to describing the role of the JDC in the everyday life in their detention camps. By the end of World War II, Europe was in the state of a total chaos and over 20 million displaced people, including tens of thousands of Jews who no longer had any place in Europe they could call home. In the early post-war years, many of them streamed to displaced persons camps throughout Europe. 
it is in these facilities JDC worked closely with the Allied forces in order to support the camp inmates. JDC's relief extended beyond basic physical aspects of food, clothing, and health, and included religious services, performing marriage ceremonies, and even publishing a full edition of the Talmud. Orchestra orchestras were, were founded, and famous artists were flown in from the US to uplift and inspire those who lost friends and family, virtually all their possessions, and sometimes even the will to live. For many in the camps, having nothing left in Europe, the next logical step was to reach the only place they might wel that might welcome them, Eretz Israel. In Palestine, however, the gates were closed. The British allowed only a small monthly quota of entrance certificates to Jewish immigrants. The policy brought the Jews of the Yeshuv to find creative, albeit illegal ways, to smuggle refugees into the country. The British, for their part, held the illegal Im immigrants they managed to catch in two central detention facilities, Atlik, near Haifa, and Latrun, near Jerusalem, gradually re releasing them per the immigration quota policy. However, as the number of sheep steadily increased, the prisons exceeded their, their capacity. Frequent prison breaks contributed to the British decision to find a more sustainable solution. After failed attempts to return the immigration ships to Europe, the British devised a plan to transfer the illegal immigrants to the island of Cyprus, then a British colony. Cyprus was chosen because of its proximity to the port of Haifa less than a day by a ship, and its natural isolation as an island that would prevent escape escapees from reaching Palestine. Nevertheless, this plan did not proceed smoothly. One unexpected obstacle was the reluctance of the British governor of Cyprus to cooperate, fearing opposition from local population, high cost of maintaining detention camps, and other potentially destabilizing effects. All those could have no, could bring noise and take the quietness of the island. Thus, the plan was suspended. However, a few months later, on July 22nd, 1946, an event occurred that was to change the, in, the landscape of, in mandatory Palestine. The bombing of King David Hotel by the, by the Etzel underground. The British swift response hit the soft underbelly of the Yishuv. The arrest of Yishuv's leaders, the confiscation of illegal weapons, and the deportation of illegal immigrants to detention camps in Cyprus. As such, the first dispatch of, the, of ships to Cyprus was a complete surprise. Neither the Yishuv leaders nor the governors of Cyprus believed that London would carry out this threat, and neither of them was prepared. Thus, the first exile arrived on the shores of the island that had never received so many arrivals simultaneously. There, they were transported to underprepared camps, formerly served as POW camps. The issue of initial reaction was not significant for two reasons. First, most of its leaders were arrested, and there was no one available to deal with this problem. Second, they assumed that the British would reverse this change as soon as they recovered from the humiliation and pain they had endured by the King David Hotel attack. A few weeks later, Charles Passman, head of the JDC office in Palestine, organized a delegation to examine the situation of the detainees in Cyprus. The British were reluctant to let anybody, especially Jewish representatives, enter the camps. However, knowing the policy, the politically neutral JDC and their experience with working with refugees, they allowed them to enter the camps to, to evaluate the situation and eventually provide assistance. JDC work in Cyprus was to last three years, during which detainees were kept on the island between 1946 and 1949, 
a long time after the State of Israel had been founded and after the British mandate had expired. JDC, in, associ in association with Havad Leman Goleka Fresin, the Cyprus Refugee Welfare Committee that was established by the Jewish Agency, National Committee for the Knesset of Israel, in cooperation with JDC, did everything in their ability to help the detainees, those who had already stood so close to the shores of Israel and were sent away and not allowed to enter it. At first, the Israeli office of JDC managed the work of, in Cyprus remotely. Rose Vitalis, a social worker, worker in the Cyprus camps, tried to fill in as resident director. But it was quickly understood that a more experienced per permanent director was needed on site. The man of the hour was Maurice Slaub, who first worked with refugees as part of the, of the United Nations Refugee and Work Agency, UNRWA delegation in Greece, and then directed JDC's work in Italy, meeting the Jewish displaced people waiting to leave Europe. Laub, who at first was hired for three months, understood very quickly that he was there to stay. And therefore, his first priority was to gain the trust of both the detainees and the authorities. In the picture, you can see a ceremony in which immigrants gave Laub a medal as a token for their gratitude. Laub's first task was to professionalize and expand JDC's activities. Shortly after his arrival, the British opened additional camps, known as the Winter Camps, named after the, their time of population. Laub hired Joshua Leibner, a member of Kibbutz Enoshofet, as his senior deputy to deal with the increased workload. Leibner, along with his family, arrived in Cyprus in early 1947. The most urgent tasks were the basic physical care of, for the refugees. The British treated the detainees as captive soldiers, which dictated a low food ration. In addition, the maintenance costs of the detainees were very high. And during this period, Britain was paying off its large wartime debts, which led to a recession and ration, rationing at home. The detainees diet demanded improvement. JDC obtained permission from the authorities to import flour to the island and provide additional bread to relieve the immediate threat of, of starvation and hunger. In addition, children up to the age of 70, sick, the injured, and pregnant women received daily supplement of egg powder, milk powder, fresh food, fresh fruits, vegetables, and more. The British military medical services, who was responsible for the detainees' medical needs, was clearly not up to the task. The clinics lacked necessary equipment and were not designed to meet the needs of the civilian, of civilian popula population. Even basic remedies for skin diseases that were very common among the immigrants were not available. Its military doctors were few in number and naturally lacked training in fields such as gynecology and pediatrics. A time resulting cases of medical mistreatment and actual injuries. To address this problem, JDC in cooperation with Hadassah brought to Cyprus a delegation of nurses, doctors, dentists, and pharmacists to provide and provided a great deal of medical equip equipment and medication. Nurses were also placed in the hospital in Nicosia to help, the, to help with the extra work, workload caused by the, the presence of the refugees. The vitality of the inmates was enormous. Especially when recalling the accuracies that many of them had personally witnessed. As in the European DP camps, many weddings also took place in Cyprus. Shown here, a receipt for JDC's purchase of wedding rings for couples who got married in Cyprus. Being not only prisoners, but also almost destitute, it was necessary for JDC staff to undertake mundane tasks such as obtaining rings, providing a rabbi to officiate the, the ceremonies, as well as more challenging tasks such as allocating appropriate housing for married couples. 
many women arrived at the camps in various stages of pregnancy, some of whom without the, any supporting family, others with only a spouse or an only fr friend they found on the way. Mothers needed appropriate maternity facilities, services, and guidance, and newborns required postnatal care, all of which were provided with the assistance of the JDC. Here we can see also a list lists of babies born in the British hospital in Cyprus. JDC's work was not limited only to the basic physical needs, but also focused on helping people rediscovering the meaning of life. In line with, the, with psychoanalysts, Viktor Frankl, Maxine, those who have a why to live can bear with almost any how. Laub also, Laub noticed the large number of young children, many of them orphans from at least one parent. These children who had gone through so much in their short lives had no formal education and in some cases were illiterate. Others who were more fortunate still required skills that would prepare them for their new life in, in Palestine. First and foremost, knowledge of Hebrew. School meant, meant not only teachers and books, but as you can see in this document, tables, chairs, and closets, as well as blackboards that were, according to Laub, one of the hardest items to obtain on the island. Adults also required attention. The JDC seized the opportunity to fill the time in the camp with professional training. Workshops teaching carpentry, tinsmithing, weaving, and more were established. And some of those, of those permitted to live could take tools with them, Palestine, and support themselves there. For many inmates, meaning was entwined with religious belief and practice. This included not only Torah scrolls, Sidurim, and spiritual guidance, but as this document shows, concern for even the smallest of details, like headscarves for women to pray on Yom Kippur. Meaning also meant supporting and encouraging the artistic abilities of many of the detainees, some who were, who were to later become Israel's most famous artists, perhaps most notably the painter Shmuel Katz. They all got their start in Cyprus workshops. Sigal will talk more about this, as well as about the arts and crafts exhibitions which were held in Cyprus. Please allow me to read to you a part, part of a June 1947 letter from Hans Beit, the leader of youth Aliyah after Henrietta Sold, who was later killed while protecting a bus of children in a convoy to Jerusalem. One of the finest achievements of these youngers is the construction of an amphitheater capable of sitting 1,500 people. I saw two dramatic performances, which were of very high standard. There are chores, an orchestra, sports, etc. One of the Madrichim, who is an artist, drew a picture of the camp surrounded by double row barbed wire. A Jew gazing at the wire remarks, there is nothing new under the sun. Nevertheless, life in the camp goes on. Performances were also important for the for, were also important from the outside to the culture thirsty population. One of the of many performers brought by the JDC to Cyprus, we find the cantor Sido Belarski, who and Israeli actors and singers from several Israeli theaters, such as Hamakate, Haohel, and Habima. The most memorable performance took place during Passover 1948 by a young girl of Yemenite origin named Shoshana Damari. Damari, then in her early 20s, was already a star in the issue. In the camps, the high popularity of her passionate voice, charismatic presence, and the fact that she even learned how to sing songs in Yiddish resulted in numerous performances a day on makeshift stages, if any, and even in front of three people in the sick bay. A highlight of these performances was her song Kalaniot, Anemones, 
widely interpreted as an anti-British metaphor. As described by detainee Aaron Weiss, Shoshana Damari didn't just sing, she brought us the voice of Eretz Israel. Finally, we might, we might be called, finally, what might be called the political or ideological needs of the detainees, those homeless refugees with Zionist aspiration and self-perceptions were also addressed. Under the watchful eyes of the Brits, Lauben and the JDC helped them develop the identity they chose to build as citizens of the pending state of Israel. Thus, Zionist activities and Zionist organizations were allowed to operate in the camp under the JDC umbrella and British supervision, or at least blind eye. In conclusion, it is well worth noting that despite JDC's extensive previous experience working with refugees all over the world, the work of JDC had presented new and significant challenges and obstacles. For the first time, they were helping people who were not free or partially free, but with actually prisoners. The fences around them were not to pro for protection, but for confinement. And the British, with whom they had previously interacted with, with as allies, were now adver adversarials. Nevertheless, the JDC and its people reconfigured their models to help those detainees and significantly improve their conditions, both from physical and from mental aspects. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anat. Our second speaker today is Sigal Harari Zonder. Uh, she is a social work worker who specializes in rehabilitation. She holds a master's degree in social work from Tel Aviv University. She curated the exhibition, Unknown History, Works of Art Created by Jewish Illegal Immigrants in the British Detention Camps in Cyprus, in the Casilla Cyprus in 2014, and the exhibition, Cyprus, The Art of Life, The Detention Camps, 1946 to 1949, at the Eretz Yisrael Museum in Tel Aviv in 2017. It's at that exhibit, that wonderful exhibit, I should say, at the Eretz Yisrael Museum that Anad and I first met Sigal. Sigal's presentation deals with the artworks and the crafts created by the Jewish detainees during their time in Cyprus. Sigal will now give her presentation. Thank you, Linda. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm very happy and excited to be here today, even from afar and online. Since our time is short and uh, there is a lot to discuss, let's begin. And the following presentation will discuss the creation of art and crafts made within these camps which were part of a large complex of cultural creations. We will examine, uh, examine the types of art, who created them, and uh, to a large uh, extent, the importance of art for the people in the camps. In the next few minutes, you will see a wide variety of artworks created in the camps, which raises the questions, uh, where did a variety of works come from? In relation to this, I would like to share on a more personal note. Uh, between the years 2010 to 2015, we lived in Cyprus due to my husband's work, who was the Israeli ambassador in Cyprus. It was important to me to find topics that connect the two countries together and the detention camps in Cyprus felt a most relevant uh, subject. And uh, as Linda mentioned, as a social worker, the mental resilience during this time period uh, was very interesting to me and the art and culture captured my heart. So I started investigating. At first, it uh, appeared that nothing was left in Cyprus. I visited the camp's area and the only thing that could be seen was the stone floors uh, that were the base for the huts and tents. 
So I came back to Israel and started uh, searching in archives and collections such as the JDC archives, of course, uh, the Yad Vashem archive, the Shomer Atzair archive, and more. Uh, some of the works were kept in the archives and the rest were kept by the Tennis themselves when they took souvenirs along with them from their detention period. In the slide you see now, there is an exciting example of this. Uh, a few paintings of the wonderful artist Peretz Weinreich, who passed away a few years ago. Weinreich was detained in Cyprus and took with him to Israel several works that he created there. Apparently, the paintings were kept in his drawer for years without anyone knowing about them. During the research I made, I reached the artist family and uh, together with them, we went to his attic and were extremely surprised to find many paintings such as this in a brown folder, which was typed Cyprus. Through my research, I learned of a special and small exhibition held in Tel Aviv during the time of the detention camps in May, in May 1948. The, that exhibition presented artworks that were sent to Israel from the camps. Actually, since then, there was no exhibition that presented the rich variety of works, and most of the art was left in drawers, archives, or with private people without anyone seeing them. So the moment I realized the richness of the works and I understood the, their uniqueness, I decided that this art has to be shown. So, after almost 70 years of these great creations, uh, I started working on a first ever exhibition in Cyprus, in Cyprus, which was eventually presented, as Linda mentioned, in 2014 in Nicosia and later in Paphos for a short time. And the exhibition led to great excitement and the Earth Israel Museum invited me to create a bigger exhibition of this topic, which was presented in 2017. And the works you will see today together were shown in both of the exhibitions. First, we will talk about the how and from what the works were created. Uh, many stoneworks were made from the tiles that were used as the base of the tents and huts. It was a local stone, similar in, in texture to marble and relatively easy to sculpt with. Uh, the the, the Nice did not have tools, so they used what they had, a razor, screws, nails, iron wires, a fork, a knife, and many more. Here are examples of some tools. A knife handle was used as a hammer and two nails were used in order to work with a stone. A different kind of art was woodwork created from orange creeds or the poles of the tents. Uh, as we can see on the left, uh, we have a photograph of the artist Shmuley Katz that Anat mentioned before, using the fabric of the tent instead of canvas. And another artist in the camp uh, described how they even use the branches uh, as a brush and created the colors for the paintings from all sorts of materials uh, that they found such even as a milk powder. Visitors from Palestine who came to help at the camps exactly described that there is some special creative power in the camps. From scratch, you make something, then you dress in it, sit, uh, sit on it, uh, cook with it, hang it for decoration, uh, decoration etc. And here we see examples uh, of creation of subjects for daily use, that they were made from all sorts of things that they had. Uh, they created a greater and candlesticks for light out of tin cans. 
uh, from the fabric uh, of the tents, they sewed shirts and sandals. Another layer of production was the creation of uh, handicraft. Here is an example of two embroidery works. Uh, the work on the left was done on a sack of flour showing the spotlight of the watchtower, a theme that reappears in many, in many works. The work on the right actually shows uh, the colorful new world they uh, imagine in their minds. Here I chose to show you a painting that describes what we saw in the previous slide, a painting of a woman sewing uh, made by an artist who later became uh, well known in Israel, Abba Fenkel. Here are examples uh, of other kinds of art. For example, coins carved with images, uh, images of the tents and watchtowers, uh, or decorated boxes and ashtrays. Some of the works they created were sold to Englishmen or Cypriots who entered the camps, and in return, they could buy toiletries or food. Here is a great example of an artwork I found with one of the families. It's a miniature tank with domino blocks to play with inside. These wonderful miniatures were created as well from the local stone uh, that we mentioned earlier. Uh, you can notice the small details even in the piano keys. And here as well, we can see beautiful carvings of uh, Jewish motifs, such as the candlesticks and the menorah. As I said earlier, in uh, relation to the materials of the artworks, we can see here that the table and chairs are made from an orange crate. Many of the Danes, uh, the, 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 the Danes uh, express their longing for their homes and their families. Here is an example of wood miniatures they created of the house they dreamt of or games for the kids. I will now present to you two examples of different and special genre. This is a unique uh, commemoration of the detainees in Cyprus who created miniature tombstones. Uh, Dr. Chava Aldobi investigated this subject and called it the wandering uh, tombs. Many of the Holocaust survivors in the camps lost their families or were the last members of their family. In fact, they had no place to mourn for their loved ones. So they created miniature tombstones, no larger than 15 to 20 centimeters, a side that allows them to be held in their hand and taken with them from place to place. On the tombstones, uh, they memorialized the names of the family members. In relation to the grief and pain, you can see a painting of the artist Shlomo Schwartz, who shared with me one of his uh, most difficult memories. It was about his, his music teacher in the camp. He remembered Professor Wolf as a beautiful person, always well-dressed, and his hair I combed back like all musicians. Uh, Professor Wolf was a lonely man and no one knew what happened to him or his family during the Holocaust. One day Shlomo Schwartz saw his teacher wallowing in the sand with messy hair and crying. Uh, Schwartz described how shocked he was and how he wasn't able to comprehend the gap between 
his beloved teacher and the person who threw himself on the floor like that. As Anat mentioned before, as part of the JDC's uh, assistance, there were also more professional artistic workshops. Uh, in the fall of 1947, the sculptor Zev Ben Tzvi arrived from Israel. He taught stone sculpting and copper plating at a higher professional level. After returning from Cyprus, Bensby wrote an exciting article in which he described uh, the passion of his student to create. He described how the, student, the students work in all weather conditions. Uh, they would work in an open tent and even when it rained and the sculpture uh, crumbled, the student did not give up. On the left, we have a painting of a black figure sculpting, uh, which represents Ben Tzvi himself. On the right, there is a statue of a self-portrait created by one of the students who later also became a sculptor. Following uh, Ben Tzvi's uh, workshops, the artist Naftali Bezem and his wife Hana arrived from Israel too. They also taught art in high and professional, professional le level. Here we can see examples of two works out of 26 that were made in a painting workshop. And together they created an album called In Exile in Cyprus. The paintings describe events from, of everyday life. On the left, we see the, the Tennis crossing the bridge between the camps. And on the right, we see the huts, the laundry, the fences uh, surrounding the camp and more. But a closer look also shows pain and sorrow which is intensified by the contrast between the bright black color and the white uh, background. Uh, among the artists who worked in the workshops was the artist Chraga Vai, who described here a theme that is expressed in many paintings. The theme, uh, the Theme refers to the denial of freedom and reality between the fences. The difficult situation uh, of living between fences and watchtowers is, is highlighted here even more in an ironic manner. We see the fear reflecting from the man's face uh, a fear of the watchtowers as if they are watching and capturing him. Here we see as well a painting that is highly professional by Tzvi Arman, who also became an artist later in his life. We see a rich de a description in color which describes uh, the daily lives in the camp such as crowded hats, the fluttering laundry, and the woman sewing. In the background is the sea they could almost never visit. And of course, above all, the guard tower watching. The Arctic Shmuley Cats, uh, uh, which we mentioned, present here in uh, watercolors the hat as he pictured it in his own eyes. Shmuel Katz uh, was born in Vienna in 1926 and uh, became a known artist in Israel. His uh, artworks were presented in Israel and the world and he received many prizes. Without noticing this, our journey described two and a half years in the detention camps. 
I chose an artwork that for me uh, described graphically and symbolically the whole situation and emotions uh, during the detention period. On the one hand, the white laundry flooding in the wind, which remains a normal daily life, but in between them and the open sea separates two types uh, of black fences. The opposition between the colors of the hope and peace and the black fences tells the story of uh, for you shall see the land before you, but you shall not go there. Uh, I will conclude with the words who were the art critic who visited the small exhibition presented in 1948. He said that the treasure must not be lost. And by that, my mission was accomplished. Thank you very much. We're now going to open the floor for questions. I'm not sure if you heard me before, whether I was mute or not, but I'd like to remind you that your microphones are turned off and we're gonna take questions via the Q&A function. Um, well, first we have a question that I think we're gonna ask Seagal to answer. Uh, does anything remain of the detention camps in Cyprus? Uh, as I mentioned, actually, it's the the only the the stones the uh, only the the floors uh, stone. As I mentioned, the base of the Hudson tents. Nothing, uh, not in the north, not in the south. Okay, um, I must assume that there were deaths in the British camps. Are there any Jewish cemeteries in Cyprus? Uh, and that? There, there is actually a Jewish cemetery that was belong to the, to the uh, Jewish community that was in Cyprus years and years okay. before. Uh, some of the uh, deaths, uh, there were several babies who died during labor or a short time after, and they were buried in a communal um, burial place. And there were also a few deaths. All of them were uh, transferred to the Haifa Cemetery. There's a huge cemetery in Haifa. And a few years ago, there was a project of, I think, uh, of the um, uh, Cyprus uh, uh, born uh, Mapilim. Uh, who tried to make a list of the names of the babies who were buried there. Uh, so today there's a tombstone with the names of the babies in the Haifa Cemetery. Mm -hmm. Are there any books to read about the Cyprus detention camps? Anat, I think you know of... <laughs> well, um, as far as I know, there's this really, really good uh, um, a booklet that came with the exhibition of Seagal, which is very recommended. I don't know how you could find it, but it's a very good one. Um, well, there are a few books written in Hebrew about this period, uh, one by Sha'ari and one by... Um, Nahum Bogner. Nahum Bogner. Exactly, Bogner. Um, those, the, those are the two main sources that we know today about the uh, history of uh, what happened in Cyprus. This is what I know. There's also a wonderful book written in English by Morris Laub. I, I'm, I'm forgetting the title at this moment, but um, he wrote a book. Okay. It's more of his memoir of the time. And there's also a, a, like a small diary of someone who was a, a doctor at the uh, Cyprus um, uh, camps who also wrote like a small diary, which was published, the diary of the doctor in Cyprus, it's called. About the the exhibition book, it's possible to buy in the uh, Earth Israel Museum. It's possible. Um, we have a few questions of people who were born in Cyprus, um, wondering how they can get their birth certificates. Well, that's a very tricky question. <laughs> What we have in our archives, which are scanned and open to the public, we have lists of babies who were born in Cyprus. 
However, if you want a birth certificate from Cyprus, you have to go to the Cyprite um, authorities. Um, they make you sign some documentation, but they give you a birth certificate uh, if, you, if you go through the uh, Ministry of Interior Affairs in Cyprus. I think there's someone who um, is interested in the exhibit, possibly. Um, somebody is asking, who was the critic in 1948 who visited the exhibition? Are there photographs of the exhibition itself? <clears throat> Can we see how the works were presented? Was the album Exile in Cyprus presented at the exhibition? The uh, the, the critic, the, the person who wrote about it, his name is Eugen uh, Klob, if I not mistake. And uh, at that day, he, he described some of the works that we saw, like the, the game for the kids and some, some works that I showed. They showed that time, so it's really very exciting. Uh, and the, the album, uh, The Exile in Cyprus, as far as I know, didn't show in that exhibition, the first in 1948, but uh, I saw uh, some pages that people bought because they didn't do only one album, they did some uh, copies of it. And uh, people even sell it. I saw one day I visited in, in uh, one of my friends in Cyprus and she showed me, showed me a piece of uh, this album and it was very exciting for me. Nowadays, yes. uh, this uh, uh, one of the copies uh, is in a Shomer Atzair archive. The JDC archives has um, has an album as well. Both album and pictures from the exhibitions. We had uh, a few of the uh, heads of JDC came to see the exhibitions, and we have pictures of them visiting. People like uh, Charles Jordan and uh, others were visiting, J and and Joe Schwartz, of course, were visiting at uh, at the Cyprus exhibition, and we have pictures of them visiting the exhibition. So we have some pictures of how it was um, it was laid out and how the things looked like. So we have that too. I remember Shlomo Schwartz, the artist that uh, I mentioned, he told me uh, when he was in the camp and uh, they would like to encourage people to come inside to the exhibition because they did also exhibition in the camps itself, uh, in Cyprus. So they promise the people if they will uh, come inside to see the exhibition, they will get some like a ball or a, I don't know, some very silly present, small and toy or something like this. But uh, this is the beautiful, I think, of this uh, subject that culture and art was so important that they exhibited uh, also in the camps itself then in Israel and then later Cyprus, Israel and so on. Uh, um, here we have two related questions. How many inmates were in the camp and what were the internees told about what would happen to them? Well, these are two good questions. We don't, uh, well, we don't have exact numbers. We have numbers at each time. Um, they were not told what would happen to them. I mean, the, the there was a lot of, part of the problem was that there was a lot of unknown and people lived, I think like all this long period of time without knowing what's going on, what's gonna be and what will happen to them. Uh, the reality was that they were allowed to get, to go to Israel by the quotas that the British authorities gave. And the, uh, the law was basically, uh, first in, first out. I mean, the people like you, the people who were there for longer stayed longer, uh, were the ones who left first. However, there were some, um, um, uh, like children and sick people, etc., were allowed to leave earlier. Also, if you got married and your spouse or uh, were uh, already, it was already their time, so you got like 
uh, uh, th go through the the line. So those were the the. Um, um, but, but mostly the, 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 they knew that there's a quota, but people did not know. And also uh, the Brits also played with the um, with those uh, with the numbers and also like they didn't want to send young men to join the army of Israel, so they didn't let them go out. They had some laws that were not related to those laws I I presented before. So but but people knew that they will leave Cyprus at the end. What I know is... Okay. Are there any remaining artworks by the children? Artworks by children. Are there any that remain? Uh, uh, I don't... Uh, I, I remember that I saw letters and the letters that kids... Uh, sent each other from Israel to the children in the camps and the opposite. Uh, especially uh, um, especially uh, art, I'm not sure, but uh, I'm not sure about it, but uh, they, of course they learn, they, they draw, but uh, nothing specially that I know about it. Did all of the detainees go to Israel in 1949? We have to remember that they left the, the, the camps not all together and the, most of them came to Israel and also we know that uh, part of them participate in the Atzma'ut uh, war and even uh, not survived after it and uh, and uh, all together, as far as we know, were uh, 52,000 uh, people all together, all these two years, two and a half years. So at that time, it was a big number. Uh, if we compare all the numbers of people in Israel at that time, it really was a mass of people. Uh, and as far as now, uh, we know most of them came back, uh, arrived to Israel. We also know that some of them left Israel after they got to Israel. I mean, from Cyprus, they got to Israel, and then there were those who left Israel in the uh, 1948, 1949. So there are people who today live in, in the States, but were in Cyprus in life. Mm -hmm. Sometime in their life. life mm -hmm. time. Well, and also we have to remember that there was a small group of people who came from North Africa to Cyprus. It wasn't a big group. It was, uh, uh, there was a number of people who came from North Africa and they found themselves also in Cyprus. Um, and also a huge group of uh, Jews who came from Romania with the three big ships that came from Romania and their story was a bit different, but it's a whole new issue. So I will not talk about it now, but there were also Jews who came not only Holocaust survivors, but also from either North Africa or Romania. We have a question from a, a scholar here who is researching the British detention camps in Cyprus and Atlit, and um, she is trying to acquire a list of Greek Jewish detainees. Is there one available to any, either of your knowledge? Um, as far as I know, all the lists of all the detainees who got to uh, um, who got to Cyprus and also to Atlit, who are today in Atlit's Bintivea uh, Pala that you mentioned at the beginning. They have the biggest and most uh, accurate database today of Mapilim, of all kinds, with all stories. The database is in Hebrew, but if you write to them emails or they have this question placed in the, on the website, it's uh, the easiest way to find them is, is to go through there. I'm, I don't remember if they have been at least by the uh, origin of the uh, of the detainees, but as far as I know, they have lists for you could search in all kinds of ways. So I think they are your your um, uh, best uh, um, place to start looking. Was it difficult for the Israeli 
artists to come to Cyprus? Difficult in what way? Yeah. Did the British permit them to enter? Uh, yes, I think uh, this all the shlichim and uh, uh, it, it was possible. I, I think the point was they didn't get in to go out, the detainees, but they let people who come and uh, and uh, especially uh, under the cover of uh, if they were doctors or teachers, and the uh, culture people, of course, not many of them, but it was possible. When was the camp finally closed? 1949, it was closed. Uh, my, my last picture was from the closing of the, uh, the ceremony of closing of the last people who left. There's a very famous picture of someone playing an accordion as well. Uh, it was 1949, and the people who were left there were mostly young men. That the I mean, Brits didn't want to take, that they'll take part in the uh, at small war. It was uh, February 1949, uh, sorry, and I would like to share a personal story. Uh, the opposite picture in Israel. My father was a child at the time. He was about uh, 13 years old. And when I started to research and investigate all this uh, topic, he told me how was excited he was as a child uh, when they knew here in Tel Aviv in Israel that the camps totally closed and uh, the post uh, make a special uh, a bull, a special- a Stamp. Stamp. A stamp, yes. <laughs> so he went to the, uh, he, uh, he sent to himself a letter to get the stamp, which was in uh, with the shape of the the ship that the last one. Welcome uh, for the the, the Cyprus the tennis, and uh, it was like uh, closed the the whole story. Very exciting, to me, of course. February 1949. Um, we have some additional information here about Rose Vitellis with a question. Um, she was the treasurer of the Haganah. And when she was in Cyprus, was she involved in, um, was she, I've lost the question now. Um, could some, wait a second. When she was in Cyprus, was she involved in setting up the underground network that allowed Aliyah Bet operatives to move through the camp and back out to Europe to bring more refugees? Well, as far as I know, she worked with the uh, detainees. I don't know about this part, but um, I will be happy to learn more about it. Uh, we'll take another couple of questions. Let's see. Were all of the detainees housed in one main area or were they in different locations far apart? Could they go from one area to another to socialize or were they limited to a single area? There were two two main areas, uh, one uh, next to uh, North Augusta, uh, a bit north, and the other was next to Xilotimbo. Uh, and each of them were, uh, were had some camps. At uh, the beginning, they didn't allow them to go out from camp to camp, but later from some of the, it was like a group of uh, camps. So they let them, for example, when we saw the, the bridge between the camps, actually it was between camps, uh, but it was depend of the time of uh, 
each time because sometimes they closed one camp and opened the other. And when that people uh, uh, went back to Israel, they opened the other. So it was some changes. Uh, one of the, uh, the tennis, the artist on tennis, uh, he told me how his mother was uh, in one camp and every night uh, her brother was detained in the other camps. They called each other and the uh, uh, guard in the uh, watchtower, he, he didn't understand what they are called each other. So it means that they couldn't cross the, all the time. Did the Haganah recruit volunteers from the Cyprus camps? Well, uh, yes and no. I mean, officially, no. The Haganah was not supposed to be there and was not supposed to work there. But as you can imagine, because I said so many times, not supposed to. Uh, well, yes, they did. They did recruit. They did also uh, train people with uh, how to fight, how to, uh, um, how you know, and fight, but not like use weapons because there was no, there were no weapons. It was called kaap kapaap krav panim el panim face to face fights. Uh, it was um, this. It was covered by, as uh, sports classes. But yes, Haganah was there, Palmach was there. Um, but if you ask people, no, they were not. So, uh, There's a question, I'll, I'll end with this one. Are there British sources on the camps? Yes, there is a British uh, scholar who researchers, who res researches the um, uh, MI5 materials, and he found a lot of, uh, of um, correspondences about the Cyprus, about how they caught the Mapilim, how, what they did, how they worked. And he published, I think, at least two articles about this. So there is material. I don't know how much and how extended, but we know there is material. As far as I know, just nowadays, uh, Dr. Yaakov Nir also published uh, a book which based on uh, British uh, sources about this time. Yaakov Nir is in our audience, actually. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, thank you both. This has been um, a wonderful presentation and um, we have many questions. Um, we uh, will keep all of your questions and those um, that we, we will share them with our um, presenters and we will try to uh, answer the questions that were not, that were not answered um, yet. Um, I hope you have all enjoyed the program today. Thank you for joining us. Our next webinar will take place on October 11th. Professor David Nassau will speak about <clears throat> Holocaust survivors in exile in Germany after World War II. David Nassau's lecture is co-sponsored by the Jewish Book Council. You can register for the program via our the JBC Archives Facebook page. Um, and I believe also by the events page and the Jewish Book Council. Uh, Facebook. We hope that many of you will be able to join us. Thank you very much. Thank you.